new beginning. New beginning. New beginning. New beginning. New beginning. Welcome to the Grief Dreams Podcast. My name is Sean Ram, and unfortunately not alongside Dr. Joshua Black today, but we're still going to have an amazing time and do an amazing interview. And we have with us, actually, you know what? Shelby is essentially like uh, a guest host in a lot of ways because she's been on a few times. <laughs> yeah, right. And we'd love to have her. And uh, she's incredible. But yeah, let's get into her bio a little bit. So she's been on a couple of times so far, episode 52 and 130. We're glad to have her back on to share some exciting news. And for those who do not know her, she is the author of Your Grief, Your Way and Permission to Grieve, as well as podcast hosts of Coming Back Conversations on Life After Loss. After the unexpected death of her mother in 2013, she became a student of grief and set out on a lifetime mission to explore the oft-misunderstood human experience of loss. Through her books, podcasts, and live events, she helps grieving people reclaim their power and peace of mind after devastating loss. So she's a certified grief recovery specialist, Reiki level, level two practitioner, and intuitive grief guide. Her work has been featured on Huffington Post, Bustle, and the Oprah Magazine. Shelby, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much, Sean. I'm really excited to be here with you again. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you on. And I, I just, uh, you know, we love having you and I love seeing your success and your career grow and, and all the different, you know, things that your projects that you have on the go got such an amazing mind and you also have an amazing community that you've really built around you so let's get into this big news what is the news the news is uh i have a new book coming out and it should be in the world actually by the time this podcast airs it's coming out on uh, september 29th 2020 and it's called your grief your way and essentially the very short of it is that it's a daily devotional for grief it's comforting and practical. And if you're in the midst of grief, it's like, here's something you can do today, every day for 366 days. It's something to think about. It's something to journal about. It's something to actually do as a practice with yourself or with your kids or other people who are grieving. Or it's a way to reframe grief in a way that helps you integrate it into your life. And I'll give this disclaimer because I get this question most often is, is it for the first year of grief? And the answer is no, it's not just for the first year of grief. It is for any year in grief. And you can dive in, I mean, in the middle of November, you could start in April, you could start January 1st and land on something that's going to be helpful to you. So it's not a book that requires a linear journey or a linear path. It's it's literally something, even if you don't follow the calendar order of things you'll get something out of it that helps you in your grief after somebody that you love dies. Yeah. And I love, I love, love that aspect of the book is that it is something, and you mentioned in the, and actually when you're writing the book that some people don't want to necessarily read a whole thing or get into a whole thing or don't have whatever, don't have the time or, or patience at the moment because they are going through some stuff. They're dealing with grief so they can pick it up and just kind of, scroll through a day, you know, it doesn't even have to be the day that it is on that day they're looking at it and find something out of it, you know, and it's all like what the way you've written it is it's they're separate in a way, but they all come together in that, you know, the umbrella of grief and, and helping people through that way. But I love that, that someone can just pick it up, get something that something encouraging, something that might, you know, help them through that day, some, some sort of insight, some sort of uh, technique, but um, ultimately, it's something that will make them, you know, feel feel positive in that light. And and I love that aspect of it. What made you want to do it like that? Well, I think I've always wanted to write some kind of short devotional on grief because I love that you said this too. Some people don't have the time um, to read, but for me, I actually lost my ability to read after my mom died. In that, it's not that I couldn't. It's not that I suddenly became illiterate. It's that I couldn't sit and read and focus for more than, I don't know, five, 10 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. And so to engage with something that's so short and so snappy and so um, powerful all at the same time was really helpful to me. And I leaned on devotionals after my mom died, but they were often very spiritual when I wasn't in the aftermath of her death, my relationship to God and the universe and blah, blah, blah was very upended. Um, or they were really religious. And I was like, this really doesn't resonate with me. And so I was kind of searching for something like this that existed in the world. But the idea for the book um, actually came from the publishing house, Penguin Random House. 
And unbeknownst to me, one of my very dear friends who sat two seats ahead of me in high school in biology <laughs> works for them as a as an editor. I believe that's her um, job title there. Not as an editor, acquisition, something at Penguin Random House. And they were looking for somebody to write a daily guidebook for grief. And she's like, I know exactly who we need. And so <laughs> I yeah. received an email in January that I thought was a prank or a joke. <laughs> and it turned out to be very, very real. And there but Penguin Random House essentially has this new imprint that's testing how fast can we get a book into the world. So between January 2020 and September 2020, this book was conceptualized, written, designed, and printed. And now it exists. Books normally take two to three years to bring to the world, and this yeah. took nine months. And so for something like this to come into the world so fast, especially right now in the midst of COVID-19, when all of us are grieving in some form or fashion, it was... I mean, this has been one of the wildest experiences of my life to write a book in two months, essentially, and then have all the other like work around it happen in seven and um, bring it to the world very quickly. I've enjoyed this whole process. And yet it's like one of the craziest things that's ever happened to me. That's so beautiful to hear, really, because it, it you know, things did align in that way and they found the right person. They found. Well, it's very who- magical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very magical. Talk about actually that time period of writing it, you know, so we're talking about January of this year, 2020. And, you know, let's talk about those experiences and what was going on in your life and just kind of all that, how that uh, came together. Yeah. So uh, the book was presented to me as an idea in January. And by the time we got, you know, the paperwork signed and I met my editor and we started assigning deadlines, I began writing this book around March 10th. And for those of us in the United States, we know that the pandemic really became an issue here around St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. That was the day I was laid off from Mm -hmm. my day jobs. I had two at the time. And my friend group, my family, I mean, all of us here in the United States, at least were just like everything got tossed off the deep end immediately. And my one job in two months between March and May 2020 was write 50,000 words about grief. And I was like, holy cow, this is going to be an experience like I have never had before in my life. And in the first days of that pandemic, it was like I was reminded what it meant to be at the beginning of grief again. Because doing grief work, my mom died in 2013. It's now 2020. So it's almost seven years since her death. It will be um, the day after Christmas. But um, it's easy as you get farther and farther away from grief for some people, including myself, to forget what it was like to be at the beginning. I remember what it was like to be devastated. I remember what it was like to not be able to read, but the emotions I felt in my body and the things I was scared of and the stories that I was telling myself at that time, those are often a lot harder to recall and bring up for me. And one bizarre gift of coronavirus is that all that came crashing to the surface is what's going to happen to all of us? What am I going to make of the future? Is there hope for happiness ever again? Has anybody else been through this? And all of these swirling questions in my mind, and that was so much of the material that I started working with for Your Grief, Your Way, is these themes of, am I ever going to be okay again? And I think a recurring message, I never said it this way in the book, but something that I keep trying to drive home over and over and over again is that you're going to make it out of this alive. There's a practical way to do it. Like there's steps you can take, there's exercises you can do, there's journaling prompts that you can engage with. But more than that, I think in your grief, your way, I wanted to instill not not a hope that was going to be constant and enduring, because I think that's a lot to ask of people who are grieving, but the possibility that hope even exists. And that's a different thing to tell people or to reassure people is that you don't even have to muster up hope right now but all I'm asking you to believe is that it, it it exists somewhere as an option for you and your life in the future. And that's really powerful. And that's what I wish I'm getting chills right now, but that's what I wish I had more access to after my mom died. And when I did find these places and spaces that were talking about grief, I was like, oh, finally, there's proof that somebody else has made it. And so I must be able to make it too, even though I can't see the road. I can't see the how. I can't see the steps. I can't see the path at all. Yeah. Um, the belief of I'm going to make it out of this alive came first. And then it was as if the rest followed. 
No, that's that's mm-hmm. beautiful. And, and you're so right. Like, isn't that odd about us humans is that even though rationally we know certain things it when we're but it's different when we're actually dealing through those emotions of an event or whatever, a memory and uh, uh, what, however our life turned out. It, but we need those reminders and guidance or, or someone who's there to tell us something because we're floundering and our brains just want to go the other way. They just want to go, you know, I'm thinking about like even, you know, people who deal through heartbreak, you know, people who have di- been divorced and, and mm-hmm. our relationships ending. It's like, am I going to find someone again? Am I going to be in love again? You know, it's, you know, it's just, it's similar to like, you know, grieving a loss and that you're, you were lost and you're so in it that like, it can be very difficult and it helps. It helps having those people, you know, like you who, who can say to someone in a short, beautifully condensed yet well-written way that, Hey, you're okay. And, and here, here, this is my story and, and let me help you through that. And I think that's, that's wonderful. You're like the grief Sherpa. (laughs) Oh, I love that comparison. (laughs) And that's so much of why I call myself a grief guide. It's funny. Somebody was writing an article the other day and they asked me to distinguish between a death doula and an intuitive grief guide. And I emailed back, I said, you have to understand Intuitive grief guide is a phrase that I made up when I started this work. (laughs) This is not an official certification program. It's not a training. It's not um, any kind of licensure that I've received from anything, but it, it became the, the words combined together that describe what I do. So the guide aspect of it is that I'm standing beside, I'm not some teacher in a podium and you're taking notes and supposed to learn from me, the almighty guru. It's not that. Um, There's very much a companioning that happens. And then the intuitive part, especially when I work with clients one-on-one or in, in groups online now in the pandemic is what needs to be said, what's in the room that doesn't have a voice yet, or what is happening in our grief that needs defining or some kind of structure or a foundation underneath to support it. And that's a lot of where the intuition comes from in grief. And I'm trained in modalities. I'm trained in the grief recovery method. I'm trained in Reiki, which is an energetic attention-based process. And so I have I have wisdom under my belt, but um, intuitive grief guide. Yeah, that's that describes what I do is this guidance, this Sherpa, this companioning that happens. Because I think what so many people need in grief, especially when you've lost somebody to death, is just a kind voice in the room, somebody who gets it, who's beside you in some form or fashion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, that comes out in, in really how you, your podcast comes out in, in the books you've written. It comes out in, in this current book that we're talking about in that your, your experience, you know, you've done a, I like to say you, you've PhD in you, like you know, you, you know, you've, <laughs> You've you've got that mastery under your belt and your experiences. You know them inside and out. And coupled with the fact that you're able to be such a great guide and teacher and you know intuitive person. I mean, labels you know throw them out the window. You're really amazing at conveying that to other people and being compassionate for them and sitting with them. And that's just the perfect combination. When it came down to choosing what topics fit where in the book, how did that kind of come together? Oh, this is a fun question. Nobody's asked me this yet. So I'm excited to answer it. Essentially, I needed to come up with, so there's 366 entries in the book and divided by two, that's 183. Somebody check my math on this. I think I did it right. I'm not sure. Um, 183. And so I, each day alternates. So I needed 183 quotes and commentary for those quotes from other grieving people, celebrities, authors, famous people who've spoken about loss, and then 183 exercises or practical tips for how do I move through this. And so the very first thing I did um, was gather a bunch of quotes. I I went on Goodreads, which is my favorite website for finding books that I want to read and rating and reviewing books that I have read. And people put their quotes that they love um, from books on that site. And so I would search grief, loss, bereavement, uh, hope, courage, resilience, things that I felt like I needed. after my mom died and and compiled this long, long list of quotes. And then in the other spreadsheet, and this was a little trickier, I went through four years of notes that I've taken while working with one-on-one clients of exercises that we developed together, um, 
mindfulness exercises from cognitive behavioral therapy, things that I've learned from interviewing people on my podcast, especially those um, who work with grief and children. So like exercises like a paper chain or a set of house rules, like a, like a family declaration of here's how we're going to do grief now, especially if you have other people in the household. And also a huge, huge list of resources that I had access to, including the Grief Dreams podcast. And then the process became one of pairing quotes to exercises. And so every day you flip on the page, there's two entries. So there's a quote at the top for one day with some commentary on the quote. And then the next day has some kind of exercise related to that quote. And it goes on with that one, two, one, two pattern through the whole book. And so I don't know if you remember doing these worksheets or anything in elementary school, but it was like pair this, uh, state with its capital and you have to draw lines right. across the yeah. page to match them. It was like that, but 183 times. <laughs> That's what I'm picturing. I'm picturing a so, huge whiteboard, you know, multicolored post-it notes, yes. you know, just lines, like some mad scientists. Like even you know, when people talk about like, oh, that's the crazy person, you know, who, who's looking at conspiracy theories, that, that's what I picture. Well, and that was kind of it, <laughs> except it all happened on a digital level. And I knew for sure there were some days in the calendar that don't change. So like Valentine's Day is always February 14th and Halloween is always October 31st. Um, and then there were some of my own special days. August 12th is my birthday. December 26th is the day my mother died. And so there were special quotes and exercises that I knew intuitively I wanted to put on those days as little yeah. either presents to readers or presents, secret presents only to myself. And then kind of the rest of it, I built around themes that could pair together like friendship and navigating friendship in the aftermath of loss. Um, what happens when I feel like I can't go back to work or how do I find a medical practitioner who acknowledges my grief experience and will help me deal with pain that has arrived after somebody I love dies. And so it's like, how can I pair or create 183 themes in grief and then find quotes and exercises that, that go with the two. Yeah. So there was a lot more people think, you know, all you have to do for a daily devotional is like write a paragraph every day for 366 days. And I thought it was going to be that easy too. And I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, you did, and, um, and you didn't have 366 days to write it either. So no, I did not. And so yeah. I, I wrote it in 60 days. So how many entries is that per day? Math is not my strong suit. Can you tell? Um, <laughs> So and about okay. I mean, four or five, six entries a day, but I didn't break wow. it up that way. And my deadlines didn't work that way either. Um, I had word count deadlines slash I had to get um, January through March entries done in two weeks. I had to get March through July done in three weeks. I had to get July through December done in five weeks. And so it was very like, here's when we're going to get the whole book done with the goal of being at least 50,000 words when it was done. And I think it's a little bit over because I'm a little chatty. Um, <laughs> but I worked with a marvelous editor at Penguin Random House. And then one of the other joys that's come from this project that I didn't expect at the beginning is that with the pandemic and everyone staying home so much, they also asked me to turn it into an audiobook. So if oh, you'd like great. to listen to about 30 seconds of grief guidance every single day, you can in in my voice. You can hear me all over again. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and you, and you have you have a great voice for that. Obviously, um, and, you know you're very calming, and and I think that's an amazing thing. I'm so happy that it, they decided to do that. I am too. I was absolutely over the moon when that decision came through. That was yeah. another email that hit my inbox. I was like, "Is this a prank?" And they were like, "No, it's real." I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> no, that makes um, perfect sense. Yeah. So that was very thrilling, and I and I thought that too because I've been doing a podcast for three and a half years and. People expect to hear, you know, my words yeah. and my voice, at yeah. least in some capacity. So to be able oh, to yeah. read an audiobook of what I wrote, although that experience was fun too, and I've never shared this in an interview before, but with a pandemic raging, I couldn't go to a recording studio because most of them are closed. And so I made one here in my home office. And if you go to my Instagram, you can see my setup and it's essentially a mic on a desk with like a foam a semicircle around it to shield for sound. But then I stacked up blankets and pillows and everything around the room to create wow. this like sound container. <laughs> um, yes. Because I mean, how do you have a professional recording studio at home? And I had to send all these sound samples to Penguin Random House and we would tweak and I would send them different pictures of pillow configurations in the room to absorb <laughs> the sound. And it was the funniest thing because I was like, here I am sitting in a pillow fort reading a book that I wrote about grief in the midst of a global pandemic. And I'm like, yeah, how right? much weirder can life get right now? Oh my goodness. That uh that they should make a movie about that now. Um but yeah, I, you're totally right. 
like the you know the absurdity of it all but also the obviously the beauty of it the fact that the you, you made your own sound studio is amazing it's so funny to hear let's get into some of these specific days because uh I think I find that super interesting. And I know there are certain days, obviously, like you talked about with your mother's death and what day that's so special for you. Do you have that on hand by chance? Or are you pulling a book? Yeah, okay. well, my first question is, is do you have a favorite entry? Because I can start anywhere if you have a favorite. I do. I do. Well, my birthday, actually, May <gasps> 23rd. Yeah. When I was reading that today, I was like, ooh, I love that one. Yeah. So do you want me to read the whole thing? I certainly yeah, can. Yeah, please. Cool. If you can. So we'll start in May 23rd. It says, create an altar for grief in your home. Whether or not you're religious, an altar is a beautiful way to give grief and your loved one physical space in your day-to-day life. I've seen all kinds of altars, ranging from the more traditional photo and a candle on the dresser type, to an entire room devoted to memorializing a loved one. No matter what form your altar takes, it should remind you of your relationship with and your love for your loved one every time you engage with it. Each time you pass by or enter into this sacred altar space, remind yourself that part of grieving is making room for grief to show up. Allowing grief space in your physical world helps you process it in your mental, emotional, and spiritual world. Yeah, that's that that's beautiful. And it really resonated with me. And, and not just because it's it's my birthday, but because it's something that I've always I believe in after learning about it is to to really understand and you know it helps with continuing bonds is to create that space for you do what you want to do in terms of you know some people see butterflies and some people pick up pennies and if that means creating a a space in your home where you want to honor the memory of your loved ones you know go go right ahead it doesn't really matter like you said whatever your spiritual faith is that's fine do do what works for you so i really love that and i love the fact that you touch back on the fact that hey each day in your life, when you do have those moments, you know, create that space, not only in your home, not only in whatever place that's comfortable for you, but to have that moment of, of awareness that you are in grief. You know, that's a part of your life. Maybe you're having a bad day, but let's mm-hmm. talk about that and sit with that. So yeah, thank you so much for putting that in there. Thanks for reading that. But yeah, that's, uh, that, that's what touched me that specific day for sure. Yeah. Well, and it resonated with an experience in my own life. And one I continue to have with my clients too, is that so many of the um, moments I have with grief is like, where does this go? My brain keeps, you know, having these thoughts or these experiences or these anxieties of like my, my person, my mother is no longer in the world, but I still need a physical place where she belongs that I can visit and like continue to engage in a relationship with her. I love that you use the phrase continuing bonds because that's exactly what it is. And after she died, probably about eight months after she died, I just moved to Chicago. I literally set up a bifold photo of her and a candle and like a plant and a crystal on my dresser. And I would kneel in front of my dresser and just like chat with her. But it was like, if I cannot visit your physical body, because we didn't, um, she wasn't buried anywhere. Even if she was, I wouldn't have been able to access it because I moved away from home. And uh, and I was just able to, I mean, create the illusion that she was still present somehow. And that meant the world to me because it was like, here's where she goes. Here's where she belongs. And here's the room, the space that I've carved out for her in my life. And that helped me kind of recognize and understand. I'm like, oh, she has about, I don't know, 2% of my living space. Maybe she can occupy 2%, 3%, 4% of my brain, heart, mind as yeah. well. Like maybe I can carry her with me in that way also. If I can make room for her in my house, maybe I can make room for her in my heart also. Cause I think a temptation with grief too is like, don't put it anywhere. Cause that means you're something's wrong with you. You're not done grieving. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm not done grieving. And that might not be bad. Yeah. So to make room for her in my home was also symbolic of reserving space for her always in my heart, yeah. which is why I included that one in there. Yeah. Oh, Happy and, birthday, and that, May 23rd. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Gemini. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's important for people to hear. And and we, it can't be understated that like, you know, there's no um, timeline. There's no barrier. There shouldn't be any restrictions like phrases like, oh, isn't, shouldn't that person be over this, you know, by now or oh, that's, that's creepy. It's too long. This and that, you know, just th- throw that out the window. You know, these are old archaic ways of looking at grief and looking at recovery and looking at healing. 
And, and that's the beauty of, of that is this saying like, hey, it's okay. If you, if, you know, you want to honor your loved one by doing that, do that. You know, I have tattoos on, on my arms mm -hmm. to honor my grandparents who've passed, you know, and that's my way of doing it. Why is that okay? You know, compared to like other, other ways that aren't considered okay, you know, but, you know, again, I think, I think we're starting to change things and then starting to understand that, hey, it's all okay. You know, if that's what you need, that that's what you need. Yeah. And I'm hoping that's the case too, because it really is just based in societal norms. I mean, you look at 19th, 18th and 19th century grief and people would be saving their loved one's hair, their teeth, wearing them in lockets yeah. around their necks. And that was fine. Or they'd be wearing black ribbons for one year, two and a half years, three years, depending on who died. They'd put wreaths on their front door that they'd never take down for the rest of their lives. And so it really depends on like what society considers is okay. And in your grief, your way, there's almost definitely, I say almost, there is definitely kind of an urge or a nudge to boldly reclaim the right to grieve. Because I, I think we all deserve it. We've been told by society, friends, family, the media that it, that grief is not okay or it's a sign that we need fixing or something's wrong with us, on and on and on. But the right to grieve is is very human and we all deserve to have it in whatever form that looks like to us. And so also an unspoken sentiment in your grief, your way is you have the right to grieve. And that's very much the spoken sentiment of my first book, Permission to Grieve, is we all had permission to grieve. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, with a fierceness to it, which I love, you know, it, it gives me that vibe. Let's talk about your the day that your mom died. Let's see, I'm flipping open to it here. I love it. I just got the author copies a couple of days ago. And so to have it physically in my hand, is yeah. still, like, okay. well, I can't believe how, this is real. How exciting, how exciting is that? Did you get like a big box? And It's always the best experience when it happens. Well, here's another thing that's happened as a result of COVID-19 is that um, I, I'm unbeknownst to a lot of people, books are printed in these giant warehouses and very similar to, to places like Amazon or pet food distributors or meat packers. They've been places that have been very heavily hit by COVID-19. And so book printing has been delayed. And so essentially Penguin Random House is like, we don't know when you're going to get your author copies. And I'm like, okay, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was just waiting for a box to arrive. And while I was doing another podcast interview on another show about the book, the UPS truck drove by my window, by my office window. And I was like, I think that's them. I think they're here. And <laughs> thank goodness he didn't ring the doorbell because it would have picked up on the mic. Um, but I ran outside and, and there it was. And I was like, oh my word. And it immediately arrived like two seconds after we'd kept the interview. And I took an Instagram video of it and the whole thing. But uh, my mom died the day after Christmas, which was a surprise to all of us, the short story of it, because I know I've told the longer version of it on Grief Dreams, um, and you can go back and listen to those episodes, I hope you will, is she had breast cancer that went into remission in January 2013. And then in late November 2013, it came back, they did a few surgeries. And by the time they kind of got in and said, there's nothing more we can do, she died a week after we got that news. So they called us on December 19th, said, you know, we've done as much as we can, make yourself comfortable you will die soon. We didn't know how soon soon was going to be. And we actually only had seven days until her death. And her last day conscious was either December 23rd or 24th. And so every day surrounding Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's is just wow. hell on earth for me and has been every year since she died. And I don't know that that will ever change. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily need it to anymore. I think in the beginning, I wanted it to go back to how it was because Christmas was my favorite holiday and the best one to have in our house. Like we had four tables worth of cookies in the, <laughs> in the house and like the music was playing and the tree would go up and there were a lot of family traditions we had about those days. Yeah. But so the chunk of time in your grief, your way that exists between about Thanksgiving time all the way through New Year's is very tender to me. Um, and readers may not pick up on it while they're in there, but if you're coping with a holiday season without a loved one, it's something I know very intimately. And so I was like, here's something I need to speak to. Um, actually, I'm going to read December 24th, which is two days before my mother's death, because this is a, a quote that my mom had framed. She received it from the oncology ward where she received cancer treatment at Duke University Medical Center. And a lot of people who grieve 
have this quote framed somewhere, have this quote tossed at them on a sympathy card or something, but they've never included the whole quote. And I found the whole quote and I was like, okay, so this means a lot more than we think it does because the quote that a lot of people see or gets printed on t-shirts and coffee mugs and blah, blah, blah is in the midst of winter, I found in me an invincible summer. And it's like, In the midst of all the garbage, when things are cold and dark and hard and unfriendly, there's a summer, a goldenness, a light, a warmth, a growth that lives on in us forever and ever. And it's meant to instill this hope that like, even if it's crappy on the outside, there's still something eternal on the inside that lives on. And for a lot of people, that's very hopeful. For me, I hated this frame quote. It was a reminder of my mom's cancer diagnosis. And the fact that she died, and I remember looking angrily at this framed photo of a flower coming up out of the snow in our dining room after she died and just wanting to smash it on the floor. And so when I was looking for quotes in this book, it came up over and over again about hope or triumph or resilience. And I was like, maybe there's a reason I need to include this, but I wonder if there's more to the story. And so the entry for December 24th reads as follows. In the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes me happy, for it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me, there's something stronger, something better pushing right back. Albert Camus. Some days, it feels like grief has all the power and could swallow us up in its darkness any minute. But what if there was something in us that was brighter and louder than the despair brought on by loss? In everyone who grieves... There is something that endures, an invincible summer that continues on, even in the midst of the harshest winter. And I included this, I wrote this piece in the book because when I work with clients, especially in a group setting, there's this sentiment that grief is stronger, grief is more powerful, grief is louder, grief has the upper hand. There's this sense that I am being crushed by the weight of grief when in years of working with clients and studying my own grief and reading about the grief experiences of others, what I found is that eventually, maybe not immediately, because it hurts immediately, but eventually we come to this realization that, oh, I am actually larger than my grief. And the meditation that follows that is one um, about swallowing grief, becoming larger than grief and actually swallowing it like a pill or a piece of candy, shrinking grief down to the size where we can take it in, digest it, make it a part of us. And it's a visual for assimilating grief into the larger picture of ourselves because grief is not all of who we are. And I think that's what that Albert Camus quote was getting at is that grief is the thing that's happening right now, but it's not all of who we are, which is why no matter how hard the world pushes against me and within me, there's something stronger and something better pushing right back. You've not lost all your power here or your ability or your selfness, whatever makes up your soul or your humanness, whatever you'd like to call that on the earth. Grief is the thing that's happening right now, but it's not all that will ever happen. Thank you for that. And and thank you. You know, you're totally right. Like it, it, the quote changes in that way, mm-hmm. a little bit less of, well, this is happening to me, imagery of the flower and then the kind of winter and setting, but then moving forward and saying, look at the power that that's within me to kind of feed myself and to give myself that power and that energy and that inner light to kind of move past that. And yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. That's what it is. You know, we have days that beat us up. We have moments, holidays, it changed. Mm. It's you, it changed a lot of it. And now you don't look at it that way, but that's not you and yourself and, and in your light and your power overcomes all of that. And that's a part that's just those are, that's just a part of your life now. And you, you're you've come to kind of understand that and accept that. But you change your surroundings, not the other way around. And, and I think that's great to also give people that type of message, that type of hope. In a, in a lot of ways that, hey, this is something, this is a, it, it is a wave. We got to keep swimming. We got to keep swimming. There might be one bigger wave that crashes over us sometimes, but we're not drowning. And I like that you said that we shape our surroundings, but I will admit too that our surroundings or our circumstances do also shape us for as much as grief presses us into a, mm-hmm. a form or a figure, into a shape, we can also press back. I feel like I get this image sometimes that I'm arm wrestling with grief. <laughs> And I'm like, somebody's got some strength in their muscles. And sometimes I'm winning and sometimes grief is winning. But the neat thing, or perhaps the hopeful thing about that is that I never feel like totally decked by grief. Yeah. There's there's times when I'm like, oh, the illusion is here. Grief has won this round. 
But yeah, my and relationship you- with grief is never done. Grief never gets the last word because my death will be the last word. And I can't say that that grief will come out on top then. Yeah. And you also mentioned this in your book, actually, where you say that having the imagery of grief as a monster, you know, we got to change that a little bit. And, and you encourage people to have those conversations with grief in a lot of ways and saying, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, there you are. How you been? <laughs> you yeah. know, what I, and I, I think that's great because it, it, what it does is it it lessens that that power that it it, it has. It lessens the monsterness of it. You know, it it in a weird way it humanizes it and makes it more soft. So you can have that conversation with something that you live with on a day to day basis. Well, and that comes very close to the core of what I experienced because I was so convinced that grief was outside of me and grief was different from me. And therefore it was this big oppressive beast that was essentially trying to kill me. Like to put it very plainly, I thought grief was trying to kill me, not realizing or understanding for about the first two and a half years after my mom died, that grief was actually coming from within me. Like I was not the root cause, but, um, the roots of grief were also tied to the roots of me. And so we were inextricably connected. And so to, as you say, to humanize grief, which is one of my favorite things to do, is to admit and acknowledge that, ah, grief is a part of ourselves. And so to hate it or to push it away or to try and lock it up or repair it or fix it or um, make it better is to force all of those things upon ourselves. And when we open the door to grief, when we welcome it, when we embrace it, when we say, hey, it's okay if you come in and sit down, it creates an entirely new experience with grief because when you welcome grief, you welcome yourself back in the room, which is, you know, there's exercises about naming your grief. I had a client once refer to grief as Kevin and I was like, that's hilarious. And so every time grief was in the room, she'd be like, God, Kevin's here again. He's so annoying. Um, And it was funny. Like it was funny. And um I have this relationship with grief where I don't know if necessarily know if mine has a name all the time, but sometimes I'll be having a, an especially griefy day and I'll just acknowledge the fact that it's in the room. I'll look at the ceiling and be like, oh, not you again. Come on, lay off. <laughs> and talking to grief this way, um, not only does it humanize grief, but you get to take, again, you get to take a bit of your power back. You get to take a bit of your control back. So instead of feeling dominated or oppressed by or smashed by the weight of grief, you get to have a voice. You get to yell back. <laughs> Even if it's with humor or with annoyance or even with anger, you get to be in relationship with this part of yourself that's very human. That's beautiful. And it's also like it, it, it kind of implies that, you know, grief is visiting and, and it might not stay. Maybe it stays a little longer. Maybe it stays for the weekend, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm in control here. And, you know, Kevin's just in the room over there. But, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I love that, though. Naming it. That's so that's so unique uh, in a lot of ways exactly what we talked about and it's just not you know de-escalating that monster and, and in turning it into something else and, and changing it um because again it, it the whole gamut of it can be fearful in a lot of ways um and can be over all overwhelming in a lot of ways and and to say that hey listen one day at a time uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna recognize this and, and move forward and, and we'll see where this takes us let's actually talk about your you putting grief dreams into your book. I think that's fascinating. This is one of my favorite parts because I think we mentioned this before we hopped on the mic, but so many people talk about grief dreams and wonder if they're normal. And every time I see something like that, whether it's online or if I'm working with a client, I'm like, you've got to look up grief dreams because it's the one place that I've found on the internet that describes them, that asks people to share them in a group, that studies them, that writes research about them. Like it's it's so comprehensive and so helpful and validating because people think I'm crazy. There's something wrong with me or I'm tormented by this, or I want to have more of them. That's where that's the camp that I sit in is I want to have more grief dreams, but I felt I was like, I need to include this in the book because this is an experience of grief that just about everybody has, but nobody talks about. We're not, it's, it's very frustrating to see and acknowledge because in, um, native American culture, something that's been, uh, quarantined, ostracized, and oppressed here, especially in the United States, like dreams were very important. And 
what people dreamed would determine oftentimes the actions that they would take in waking life or the decisions that they would make or the relationships that they would or would not enter into or the rituals that they needed to perform. And I mean, this goes beyond Native American culture, surely, but um, it's sad that Westernized society, especially white supremacist culture, has squashed that and and wiped it out. And so to recultivate or reintroduce the the holiness and the sacredness of having a grief dream is really powerful. And so I'm enormously grateful for the fact that that yours and, and Josh's platform exists at all. When I met Josh for the first time, I was like, holy cow, this is so cool. <laughs> um, I've never heard of this and yet I'm so excited it exists. And in something that you all do, there's a reclamation of this very ancient practice of paying attention to what we dream and who we dream about and how. And so the entry for October 8th says, just about everyone who grieves has a dream of their loved one at one time or another. These dreams take all forms from soft, lighthearted visitations to vivid, panic-inducing flashbacks to bizarre, silly happenstances. If you would like to see your loved one more often in your dreams, try writing your dreams down in a journal for 30 days. The moment you wake up, set a timer for 10 minutes and record everything from your dream that you remember. Doing so triggers your brain to recognize that you are paying attention to your dreams, and gradually your brain will learn to provide you with more focus and recall in the morning. If you can't remember your dream or know you didn't dream, uh, simply write, I didn't have a dream last night, and wait to have a dream the next time you sleep. You can find out more about grief dreams and listen to the grief dreams of others at griefdreams.ca. And I think this is just so powerful for people to be able to access. And I actually taught myself how to remember my dreams. After my mom wow. died, I went through, I read this very feminist empowering book called Red Moon. But one of the exercises in the book was to record your dreams for 30 days. And this was before I started doing grief work, before I knew about grief dreams, like pre, pre everything. <laughs> um, and I found that by recording my dreams for 30 days, my recall was so high. And so at the beginning, I was like, I don't remember what I dreamed, or I think I caught a snippet of a hot air balloon or something like that. But by the end of 30 days, I had some sequence or some themes or some messages. And I've had very powerful dreams in my life that have, you know, prompted me to quit jobs that were toxic for me or start conversations with people that I hadn't talked to in six or seven years, just because I dreamed of them or process and move through the death of my mother and continue to, this is something, um, she continues to show up in dreams. She hasn't in a while in my life that I can distinctly remember, but in the ways that she has, I mean, I still remember the dreams I've had of her so far because they were that powerful. And because I taught myself to recall those dreams and there's this ache in grieving people sometimes to see them again, to hold them again, to touch them again. And I can't guarantee how your dream's going to turn out. I can't guarantee it's not going to be a nightmare in the book. Like that's not a, a promise I'll give you because I still have those of my mother's death also, but dreams sometimes are the, are the closest we can get. And so this yearning to have grief dreams, even if we haven't said it out loud, I think is really present. Well, thank again. Thank you so much for including us into the book. Thank you for doing justice to what it is. Like you, you talked about the number one thing. A lot of, a lot of people talk about why well, I don't get these grief dreams and recall is the number one reason we factor into getting those grief dreams as we'd like to point out, which is beautiful. And you guide them in that step of how to, how to, you know, slowly start to get those grief dreams and remember them. But yeah, it's look, it's one of those things that it, when, when I first heard about all of this, I thought it was like a little bit silly, like, wow. So people out there don't really hold value into dreams because i've always the way i was raised that you know my mother did a great job of letting me know that dreams were important mm -hmm. but i didn't know that other people didn't look at them like that so hearing about dr black's work and going through all that and realizing that like hey a lot of people don't remember them a lot of people don't even tell other people about them and and especially with with the grief dreams i'm like man this is such a great topic to get into and learn about and i think it's fantastic that you know people like you can tell your story, share your story about how they've impacted you. Cause you're absolutely right. They can really change things um, in a person's life. And, and now you have these new memories in a lot of ways. Dreams, you know, do that. They give you that new memory, that new positive thing they carry on in your life and look back at and say, Oh, I had this amazing dream with my mom and I got to do this and this and this with her. Um, so yeah, again, thank you so much for, for touching up upon that and, and to doing a really good job of guiding people 
on on how to give respect to that that space because and you you do that throughout your whole book in that there's all these different areas you know um that you do justice to providing a space for a lot of ideas a lot of new ways of kind of looking at grief and new ways of recovery new ways of healing and you bring that all together in your book and i find that that you did a, a really good job with that because you know you've looked at this for how long now i mean you and you're one of those people who you you, you see a new idea and, and you look into it and you say oh how can how can this apply to my life so which is a beautiful thing relentlessly studying <laughs> That's how I would divine myself. I call myself a student of grief and I feel as if I continue to be. And even if the thing I'm studying is not like a grief thing, like even if I'm not reading a grief book or listening to a grief podcast, I'll be like watching a show on Netflix or on a FaceTime call with one of my friends and even something they're saying, I'm like, oh, how can I see this through the lens of grief? And some of my greatest insights have come from moments where I'm not actively pursuing information about grief, but something ties in somewhere else. And you kind of see that everything is grief and everything is, isn't grief at yeah. the same time. And grief, well, especially now in, in the time of COVID, grief is everywhere. There's the grief of normalcy. There's the grief of stability. There's the grief of anticipating the unknown. Um, there's the grief of milestones missed. And then of course, there's the very real and heavy grief of lives lost. And so there is just so much spoken and unspoken grief in the air always I feel like I'm perpetually wearing this set of glasses where I'm like, okay, where's the grief? <laughs> I'm sniffing it out. I'm always <laughs> looking for, for where it exists and how it applies. And it's not always sad. I'm not always, you know, walking around in the world with a cloud of doom and gloom over my head, um, pursuing things that are dark, scary, or traumatic. It's a, it's a very soft lens. It's like one of those clouded translucent lenses of like, oh, where does grief exist here? The imagery I have of you is like just you have this beautiful armor on, you know. But it's mm -hmm. it's it's and and not to say that you're hiding something, but to say that you you've developed a, a beautiful kind of like protection and and way of moving around the world, and you're ready. You're ready to to look at that deep in the eyes. You know, you're looking at those those moments or those those the darkness, if you will looking at the clouds, you know, even approaching people who look like they're suffering and willing to engage and willing to move into the, you know, that, that takes courage. Um, so I think that's, that's the imagery that, that I see around it, but you know, it's, it's just beautiful to have in, in this time, you know, you see a lot of people who definitely are suffering, whether inside or outside, visual, not visual. I have a neighbor who has to move for various reasons and they're just sad. You know, I saw them and I was, I, I I talked to them. I brought them a coffee. I was like, you know, it's, it's going to be okay, you know. And, and, and I know, I know, it, it's tough. It, it's a lot of things are accumulating. And I think like a book like this, and, and again, even even if they just listen to your podcast, I think hearing a person like you talking to a person like you is is so important. And if you need that, then definitely seek out. We'll provide whatever resources, whatever links we have um, on on our website. But yeah, I mean, I, people like you are, are are really needed in a time like this. And, and I think uh, I'm glad that, uh, you know, they have a guide, a Sherpa like you. Yeah. And it, well, it goes back to that theme um, from the beginning of our conversation is like, I'm not asking you to believe in hope or become hopeful. I'm only asking you to believe that the possibility exists somewhere, maybe one day down the road. And even that is something to hold on to right now. Yeah, I, I love this work. I feel like I meant to do it for quite a while. And so I'm really honored and grateful that that this opportunity has literally fallen into my lap via falling into my inbox <laughs> from Penguin Random House to to write a daily book about grief, because I think that we need things right now that aren't going to hit us over the head, that aren't going to require a lot of energy of us, and yet are going to feed us something that is nourishing and helpful right now. Um, those are two words I've been focusing a lot on in my work is, is how can I be nourishing and how can I be helpful at, at this time in the world? And my words are always changing, but um, yeah. So it's my hope that your grief, your way will be comforting, practical, nourishing, and helpful in whatever way it applies to you, however you decide to use the book and whenever you decide to pick it up. So, yeah. That's beautiful. And, and I love the word nourishing. It's uh man, that's, 
that's what it is. It's it's healing. It's giving. Let's end on a dream you wouldn't want to have tonight. Yeah, I love this question. I'm so glad you're not asking me about a dream I've had recently because I haven't had a grief dream in a long time, um, over a year probably, but I always have ideals for what dreams I would like to have. And the one with my mom that I'd like to experience soon tonight (laughs) would be awesome, um, is I know for a fact while we were growing up, she expressed kind of this secret or, or underground dream of being a writer. And after her death, we discovered um, short stories in a notebook that she kept in her nightstand and in other little notebooks scattered around the house. And in some ways, I feel like this project, my first book, Permission to Grieve, but really with this book, Your Grief, Your Way, is the culmination of a dream that she didn't get to complete in life because she died at 51. And she was just coming into empty nesting. And and I think she was going to take it up and and really begin writing a lot more um, and didn't get the chance to. And I would love to have this dream where she and I are, you know, sitting in a coffee shop with no masks because COVID doesn't exist in dreams. (laughs) And and for her to just be sitting next to me and and reading this book with me and and feeling that parental pride and offering that parental pride, because nobody else can give it to you but your parents, really, Mm -hmm. of look, look at what you've done, look at what you've made. And I'm so glad that this dream of mine got to be fulfilled through you. And I, every now and then I, I'm getting chills right now, but every now and then I hear her voice in my head. Cause when she would talk about us, um, she would like tell people about our accomplishments and the trophies we won and the grades that we got and blah, blah, blah. But I think a lot of the time she would focus on our hobbies or the things that we were interested in. And I heard this quote once of, yeah, your kids are great at school, but do you like them? Like, are they cool people? Like, do you do you enjoy spending time with your children for as much as you hustle them into, into getting the grades or getting into the college or or doing all the after school activities? Do you like them as people? Would you spend time with them as people? And every now and then I hear this voice in my head of my mother, my kids are just so cool. And that that pride. And I don't know if she ever said this in life. This may just be something I'm, I'm fabricating in my brain post death. Um, but my kids are just so cool. I look at my life and I look at my sister's life and the things that we've done since her death, which have been very similar and very different. My kids are just so cool. And so to hear her say that or something like that in a dream, especially as it relates to her dream of, of writing and becoming a published writer, gosh, that would just be so cool. That would be really really phenomenal. And I would, that would be a grief dream I would treasure for my whole life. That sounds amazing. And I'm so happy you shared that with us. And I I mean, I didn't know that she also wanted to be a writer. I think that that's so special and moving forward in your life is, is, you know, you carry that with you of that dream that you're both kind of like involved in. And, you know, I really hope you get that uh, dream tonight. I think that's, that would be amazing. And wouldn't it be something if like you guys eventually, if you had more dreams, you could write a book together, just yeah. for your dream. <laughs> and I can only imagine, I'm laughing because I can only imagine the, like dream number 285 where we're editing this one paragraph and getting into a fight about, you'd have to, about yeah, I know, right? is it and yeah. or what? Should we be using thorough you'd or have true? To, <laughs> and you'd have to obviously co-author, you know, allow her a co-author, co-author credit. And, you yeah, know, I'm like, does she get royalties? How does this, how work? Does this work? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That, that would be, would be a riot, though. That would be so much fun. Possible, but yeah, I think that'd be amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Shelby, for coming on, for sharing the amazing news with us. And again, we're so happy and excited, uh, and we just love seeing you know your success and what you uh, what you've done, and, and also how you give back so much to the community. Um, could you share your links and where people can find you, and also um, maybe where they can purchase the book when it's available? Yes, totally. Um, you can actually pre-order the book right now um, through Amazon, Indie Bound, Bookshop, your local bookstore. I've had clients who are in Australia and Europe who've been able to order it through their local bookstores. So a huge thank you to Penguin Random House for making this available literally internationally. There's one umbrella and everything is underneath it. The book, the podcast, working with me one-on-one, and that is com. Literally everything I do, everything I offer is at shelbyforsythia.com. So I will not complicate the soup <laughs> <laughs> no that's great and uh, we will provide obviously a link for that so yeah again thank you so much for coming on we really appreciate it 
Everybody can check out our platform at griefdreams.ca for more information on the topic. If you would like to contribute to the podcast, you could do so. Uh, There's links on the website. If you have Facebook, you can join the Grief Dreams group. You can share your dreams or hear more dreams of others. Um, And as well, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Grief Dreams. And as we always like to end the show with love and gratitude from us to you. Just myself, you have introduced yourself. This is a very good conversation.